Welcome, I'm Pastor Steve, and I'm standing here at Oheyawahe, this beautiful overlook of the city of Minneapolis. I can see in this direction, and I can see the city of St. Paul over here. Oh, Oheyawahe, you might not recognize that name, but you might know it as Pilot Knob. I'm starting this sermon here for a couple of reasons. One is earlier this week, I went on a little adventure. Uh, one of the things that we're doing this summer as our Easter Family Ministries team is we're trying to put together a summer family adventure so that families each week can have a destination to go to and do a little Bible study and activity. It's going to be really cool. Uh, and so I was thinking that Pilot Knob could be an interesting destination. And being the new kid to south of the river, I really didn't know much about Pilot Knob. I just heard the name. And so the, earlier this week I did some research and I came out here and what I discovered deeply impacted me because what I thought was just going to be Pilot Knob, you know, just a, a rock formation that the riverboat pilots uh, used to navigate way back in the early 1800s. Oh no. What I found was Oheyawahi, which is the indigenous name for this land. That this ground that I'm standing on right now, among these seven granite monuments to the seven nations that would gather here for council fires this is holy ground for the dakota people and i've been doing some research in the the history and the background and and i've been deeply moved and and i'm standing on sacred ground up on top of this hill this was a burial ground for the dakota people and there is a long and horrible history of how European settlers came into this region and basically took the land from the indigenous people. And so I had that experience today and uh, we have all had the experience that has happened over the last two weeks. We're right there in Minneapolis. The city was literally set on fire and the whole nation has been ignited around the topic of racial injustice. And again and again, it, it, it surfaces like a virus that we just can't get rid of and can't get over. And on top of all of that, as the preacher this week, I have been tasked with our second week in our series of blowing in the wind, looking at stories from the book of Acts and our text from this week is found in Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul climbs up on a hill just outside of Athens, Greece. And he has a conversation with some people who have a very different perspective on God and the world and reality than he does. And he finds a way to find common ground. And so I thought, all of those things coming together, this is the place that I want to preach from today. Um, so the text for today, again, is Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22 through verse 31. Uh, in order to get some context for this, we have to remember and go back and just quickly review who the Apostle Paul was. Remember, he's the guy who was born a Jewish person, but he lived in a Greek city, and he was a Roman citizen. So he had these three different cultures converging in his own life. And at some point in his life, he moved back to the city of Jerusalem and decided that he wanted to become a rabbi. And he became deeply entrenched in the law of Moses and the way of the Pharisees. And he became encased in a particular way of understanding God in the world. And he believed that everyone else who didn't believe the way that he did should be eliminated. At one point in his life, he was so against the disciples of Jesus that he felt that they were a plague against the world and he got marching orders from the religious leaders of Jerusalem to go to a northern city called Damascus so that he could arrest and possibly execute the disciples of Jesus because he thought that they were so disrupting the way of the Jewish people in Jerusalem and Israel. That's who this guy was. And on his way to Damascus, he encountered the risen Christ. 
Now, what's really fascinating is he is he is the only New Testament author that uh, an apostle who wasn't one of the disciples who walked with Jesus as Jesus was walking around Galilee, just like looking like just you and me doing amazing things, but being completely human. The Jesus that Paul met on the way to Damascus was the risen Christ after the resurrection in this new way of being where the kingdom of God was beyond a particular location and it transformed him. It disrupted his life. It shook the foundations of his worldview. And this risen Christ sent Paul to those very people that he thought were on the outside to tell them the good news that the kingdom of God is for all people. That's who this Paul is. And as he's going through his journeys, he comes to this city of Athens, Greece. And you'll remember that Athens, Greece was the very center of what we consider Western civilization. 500 years before Paul comes to this city, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were doing their thing. And they were disrupting the Greek culture in their own way, challenging the ancient gods of Zeus and Apollos and Athena and all those, that pantheon, and wondering if there might be something beyond. And so it tells us in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, as Paul enters into Athens, he looks around and he notices these shrines to all of these different gods. And he, he, he's, he doesn't know what to do with this. And so he starts talking with people about these different gods and about the risen Christ. And he gets into uh, conversations and to the point where he's invited to this place called the Areopagus. And the Areopagus you might know it as Mars Hill. It's the hill of Ares. It's this rocky uh, outcropping just outside and above the city of Athens. And it's the place where the leaders of Athens would gather to make huge decisions and judge cases that were capital offenses. And so it's kind of a big deal that he comes to the Areopagus. And they ask him, tell us more about what you're talking about. And so let me just read the words to you from Acts chapter 17, verse, starting in verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. In other words, you're deeply spiritual people. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And then Paul launches into a speech that is one of the best speeches in the Bible. And he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though God needed anything, since God gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. So you see, we say saying as the creator of all things, there's two things. One, doesn't, doesn't live in a box, which is really interesting coming from a guy who grew up as a Jew who had made a big deal about the temple in Jerusalem. He's like, the creator of all things can't be boxed in. And the second thing, this creator of all things isn't in need of human help. The word there, the Greek word there is therapuo, which everywhere else in the scripture is translated to be cured of something. And I think what Paul is saying is, you know, one of the things about the Greek gods is that the people thought that the gods actually needed them to feed them and to encourage them. And if the people didn't do this, then the gods would either get angry or go away. And Paul is saying, no, the creator of all things is not that petty and doesn't need us to therapy God, right? And so then he goes on to say, uh, from one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps, and indeed touch God and find God because indeed God is not far from each one of us for in God we live and move and have our being even as some of your own poets have said for we too are God's offspring in other words hey we are all God's children since we are God's offspring 
We ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent, because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So that's the text. Man, there's so much going on here. But what, what Paul is, is saying to the people is, it, let me just put it in my own words. It's, it's like, hey, look, I see that you are seeking God. And, and here's the God that, that I believe to be true. And I am telling you this, as I stand here as Pastor Steve, one of the pastors of Easter Lutheran Church, as I stand here in 2020 on this sacred site of Oha, Ohe Yahweh, Pilate Nob, I say to you, the God that we proclaim is the creator of all things, who has established all nations, including the seven nations of these monuments, including the the various colors of skin that inhabit Minneapolis and St. Paul and Egan and the whole world, that God has made all things. And in God, we all live and breathe and have our being. As the uh, theologian Paul Tillich said, God is the ground of being from which all being springs forth. And what Paul is saying to the Athenians and what I'm saying to you is that this creator of all things is beyond the boxes that we build, is beyond the statues that we construct and the creeds and confessions that we write. Because we as human beings, it's, it's natural tendency for us as human beings to want to flock together with people who are like us to keep us safe. I mean, way back in the, in the prehistory world, that was an important way to survive, right? to be a tribe and to protect yourself and, and and it's good and natural to to want to do that but as soon as you believe that your tribe and your skin color and your particular way of understanding how and who god is is the only possible way to understand it and you're willing to kill for that then paul calls that idolatry and so do i God is beyond all of those things. And God has said there's three important words that we need to unpack in this passage. This creator of all things has appointed all of these nations to seek God, to touch God and find God, right? That is the intention of all of these individual nations so that each nation can understand God in their own way and bring this beautiful perspective of, of who God is to the world table, right? But the three important words to unpack are this, that God who has established all these nations is going to call and is calling all of nations to repent. That's the first word. And the, the Greek word for repent is metanoia. And it literally means to change your perception of reality. It doesn't mean clean up your act before God will love you. <laughs> it means change the way you perceive things. And I believe what God is calling us to do is to change the way we understand how skin color affects place in society, to change the way that we understand how God is to be worshipped and how God is to be uh, approached, right? That God is bigger than the boxes that we build. So first we need to repent. And then the second thing is it says that God is going to judge the world. Now that sounds super scary and condemning. But the thing is that the word judge, dikaiosune, comes from uh, uh, the word simply means to discern, to divide, and to see, right? You remember when Jesus in, in the Gospel of Matthew says that you and I are not to judge? What, what Jesus is saying is it's not your job to decide who's good and who's bad, who's in and who's out. The only person who can do that is the creator of all things. And God is the one who will judge all nations. And here's the third word. 
will judge all nations in righteousness. And the word righteousness in Greek is dikaiosune. And that word righteousness is so theologically loaded after you know, 1,500 years of Christian theology. That we tend to think that the word means goodness. And we have created this hierarchy of righteousness. Like, I'm righteous and you're unrighteous. I'm a good person and you're a sinner. That makes me better than you, which gives me reason to dismiss you, you unrighteous swine. <laughs> right? But that's not, what, that's not a helpful understanding of this word. The word righteousness can equally be translated justice. God is going to judge all nations justly. And if God is the creator of all things and we are all God's children, what creator and parent of a child is going to decide between children and to say, I like you because you have a different color skin than this one, so I'm going to dismiss these and only love you. I don't think that's the righteousness of God. God is the one who gets to make those decisions. Our job is to love everybody because God does too. And then you're like, well, how can we even believe all of that? So here's the clincher. The Apostle Paul says to the people on Athens, on Mars Hill, he says, here's how you can trust all of this. Because there is a man named Jesus. Actually, he doesn't say Jesus. He says there is a man who God has raised from the dead. And because God has raised this man from the dead, we can trust that God is going to judge the world righteously. Well, like, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what I think Paul is saying. The fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead shows us the pattern of our life. That we need to die to the things that box us in. That we need to die to these prejudices that we have, to these God boxes that we create and take them right to the cross with Jesus. And if we die to those things, which is also called dying to self, then we rise in a new life. We've just got done with a series called Practicing Resurrection. Well, this is what it looks like. That the Apostle Paul can go to the city of Athens and speak to people radically different than him and find common ground and say, God is the, the parent of all of us. And we leave it up to God to judge rightly and justly through God's love. So, as I stand here on this holy ground, looking at these seven monuments to the indigenous nations that my ancestors stole this land from them, I declare to us, I proclaim the same God that Paul proclaimed on that hill so long ago, the creator of all things, in whom we all live and move and have our being. We are all God's children. We all have something to bring to the table, some understanding of the nature of God, and we need to learn how to talk to each other to listen to each other, and to become a better people, to worship the God of all nations. And we can do this because the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us the way. Well, people of Easter, it's been a big week. It's going to continue to be an interesting summer. I hope that this passage from Acts 17 and this visit to Ohe Wahi has been encouraging to you to be people of resurrection, to be Easter people in our world. Amen.